Hello, friends. So our next video on this particular book, The Rosicrucian Manuals by H. Spencer Lewis. Now I've gotten an, a bunch of accessory books into this because it does reference other books that I still have to give a read to. As you can tell, we have quite a bit to go over. So let's just jump right into it. We had left off on getting into some uh, of the more specific uh, diagrams. Like we move past a lot of the, let's talk about our system and process and what makes us legitimate. Although there's a little bit of that weaved in here. And let's start talking about actual manuscripts and, uh, and um, we went into some, we went into this kind of thing, this uh, the plates which are the lessons, the start of the lessons. So the first section here is on crystal, crystallology, which I found kind of interesting because when reading about the crystal faces and some of the illustrations of what they're trying to do, it, uh, it really talks kind of about how crystals grow and how that ties into what they refer to as the law of triangle. And um, the it, the law of triangle forms in in crystals in and of itself. And when it's going through, so crystal uh, crystallography so beautifully illustrates the law of triangle in all of nature that we urge the student to investigate the subject in, in encyclopedias or other reference books. For those who cannot do this, we append a short article here on the subject. Before reading that article, let us call attention to the charts on the opposite page. So the charts are really talking about different types of crystals, including on that bottom part, that's ice crystals. Because you know, they're not ever the same, no two snowflakes are the same. They're all built different. Uh, so in particular, it talks about, a crystal is a portion of inor inorganic matter with a definite uh, molecule structure and an outward form bound by planes uh, by plane surfaces called crystal faces. The conforming of these angles of a triangle, conforming to these angles, they, so they're in triangular shape is what they're saying there. Uh, da -da. And when you go through and you kind of read the rest of this uh, stuff, it it talks about how crystals are formed and the way you do that and how you can how you can grow them because remember these are all meant for them to take you know they they get these papers in in home right and they're supposed to be reading the study materials but then also going through and doing science experiments that's what they're meant to do so the Best means of studying the formation of crystals is afforded by evaporation of a solution of some soluble compound such as salt or blue vitriol, which is a substance with alchemy you'd have to go make, uh, until it is supersaturated when the crystals of the dissolved substance will be thrown down. If the two substances, such as salt and borax, are dissolved in the same solution, the result of evaporation will be crystals of both substances. Each set of molecules building themselves up in distinctive forms. Now, there's a, a lot more, you know, science-based information in here, which, you know, I'm not really going to go over. If you're really that curious about crystals, uh, which I am, I love crystals. I have them all over my house. Tucson is home to a uh, the largest uh, gem and mineral show in the world, uh, usually starting in the last week of January and into uh, February. So there's all kinds of education to be had there about different things. But what this really sounded like to me was one of those crystal growing kits. So to do a little at home practical alchemy, I got myself this little crystal growing kit, uh, which had more crystals on it. You can see them there in the base. I have a kitten. My kitten decided it was really going to go after it. Uh, this is a Swaharo cactus. Uh, they're native to here. You won't really find them anywhere else. They only exist in the Sonoran Desert where I live. But if you look there pretty closely, right, you can see down on that base there, there are more crystals forming down at the base. So it just sort of makes an entire crystalline structure, which is really rather fascinating to watch grow if one likes crystals, which I do. 
Uh, and uh, I don't I know why and there are people that don't. Uh, I've never actually met anybody who said they don't like crystals. <laughs> next, of course, I live in Tucson, so that might be why. The next section here is on magnets. Magnets they cover in basic science class. At this point, you, you know, if you're in grade school, uh, and they do, there's nothing about what they're talking about magnets that is not provable science. At this point, we know this. So, uh, but it's, okay, all living uh, vital bodies, whether mineral, plant, or animal, have magnetic polarities, and all such living things are therefore magnets, with both positive, which they say is south, and negative, which is north, poles, or polarities. But in one sense or another, each of us has one of the, the polarities predominating through greater strength. Thus, we speak of the body being of positive polarity or negative polarity, referring to the predominant magnetism of the two poles, which is interesting because most of what they're saying here about, you know, uh, magnets, totally true. Um, some parts in here, though, bodies being negative or positive polarity. Uh, I'm not sure what sensitivity of equipment we would have to use in order to prove that in today's modern society, because I know if I wave my hand over metal, it certainly doesn't stick up to my hand and hold it there. Uh, but you do kind of want to hold in your energy space, since in this time that this is written with these particular people, it's not science and magic, it's science and magic, right? And in an energetic sort of uh, fashion, if you're following... Um, say Reiki or other energy, you know, transference practices, um, which, you know, if you don't know what Reiki is, I suggest that you look it up because uh, it, it is, it's, it, I find it to be very uh, interesting. It, it does deal with your uh, chakras and, you know, bringing things back into balance, but we do try to be in a state of balance. You do want to be centered and balanced and even. Right. That's that's uh, and it makes for better as an overall. You'll have your blood pressure will be lower. Your body will be in more in center. You will feel healthier if you don't allow yourself to get too stressed or anxious. So, I, you know, and there are people that I know who do practice Reiki that do recommend putting magnets on the body. So this is a theory that still exists in today's world, just not in mainstream. And I doubt it was in mainstream then either. But you can indeed buy these little tiny magnets that look like they're attached to little circular band-aids and then you're supposed to stick them in certain places on your body to help uh, relieve pain or uh, bring yourself back in the center. Now the next portion in this book is talking about the evolution of the cross and the cross is ancient. The cross predates Christianity and you know, Jesus was crucified on the cross. There were no Christians then because that religion wasn't made yet. Though people had been dying on the cross before then. So they, however, they do talk about the first and definitive form of the cross is a mystical or secret symbol called the Tau cross, which was used by the ancient Phoenicians, which uh, does have a very particular shape to it. There is a, a circular head and then it kind of comes out and the arms stretch out of the cross and then there's a seam. Uh, for that symbol. And if you can uh, look it up, the Tau cross, T-A-U cross, and see if you can uh, find it. So you can form your own opinions based upon that. The way uh, they go through and talk about the rosy cross, which in their parts, they don't really talk about, they don't use the term rosy cross. They use Rosa Crusa. And they, they're very specific about this because they're trying to differentiate themselves from another uh, groups from other groups that they say are illegitimate groups. Uh, but it is supposed to be a symbol of, it's a divine symbol. Let me read it right here. That, because it represents the true divinity, divinity of man and all of nature. So they follow a principle um, which basically follows a, 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 a system of called I am. I am does not recognize the difference between uh, the divinity of an individual person's soul and the divinity of, you know, creator. It, there's no difference there. So they recognize them as one and the same. 
uh, and these particular ones, when they're doing their, their Rosa Crusa, they use the cru crux on sana, and that's their symbol of immortality and reincarnation. And that is all it is supposed to be used for. It's not supposed to be used anywhere else. And those, the rose symbol in the center of their rosy cross is always a red rose. It's never any other color. And it's very, and it's always a gold cross. So they're, because they're very, still very much concerned about uh, not being confused with any other group, which has, may have some practices that they don't agree with. There's a little bit of that in the beginning, which I found interesting because that means there are groups out there that are probably practicing these things they don't agree with. The next part is, this is part of the six uh, degree temple reference. So it is talking about digestion and nutrition. Here. And this gives us a wonderful little diagram. And then very in particular, it is well for our members to understand the mechanical process of eating and digesting food. We must keep in mind that food, whether liquid or solid form, supplies the negative elements for the human body, just as breathing supplies the positive elements. It is when the positive elements in the breath of life come into contact with the negative elements of the physical body that there is a unit formed of negative and positive polarities that constitutes life through the chemical action as well as the psychic action. And then the drawings are supposed to help explain that to you. I find that in particular pretty interesting because this is clearly one of those cases where they were kind of onto something, but science doesn't currently support what they're saying. And I, it's not a case of science hasn't caught up. It's just that their scientific premise was wrong to start off with. But I mean, this was written long before, you know, modern medical knowledge. So some foods are negatively charged, like sweet potatoes, uh, green beans, cucumbers. We also call those alkaline foods. Other foods are positively charged. Those are acidic foods like corn, blueberry, lentils. Um, positive foods contain free radicals, which are bad. We don't want them. We don't want them in our system. They, they do nasty things to our body. Alkaline foods are uh, uh, contain antioxidants, which fight the free radicals. So it's really kind of more important to have food that is alkaline based than it is to have foods that are acidic based. So, and you can find them all over the place now. This is a, a subject that is very widely covered if you go look at your nutrition uh, guidelines for anything. It does talk about the need to take in less acid. Your stomach is uh, filled with acid for the breaking down of foods. And if you add more acid on top of the acid, you'll end up with things like acid reflux. Uh, and you'll end up having to take medicines like uh, omeprazole for GERD. And I know this because I take this medicine. Uh, but you, know, you can change some of that up by trying to eat a more alkaline diet, which is really basically what I've switched over to it's kind of necessary because I'm already battling that problem because some of that is genetic and what are you going to do? So the other uh, next chart here, and this is talking about the circulatory system. So, I mean, they were trying to get into some science. They are, you know, the Rosicrucians were alchemists. They were doing science. They were trying to use science in connection with spirituality and, and you know, psychic abilities to interact with their world. So I found this particular part in here very interesting because it talks about blood being positive or negative. Now the negative ele elements forming negative blood enter into the right side of the heart and, and from there are sent to the two pulmonary arteries to the lungs to be made positive. That is, each negative blood cell is sent to the lungs to receive positive polarity from the lungs. This vitalizes the blood, returns it to the left side of the heart, and it is pumped through the, bo the body through the arteries as part of, to the parts of the body. As this pot of positive blood, vitalized, travels through the system, it uses up its vitality or positive polarity and becomes only negative cells or negative blood. Where it changes from positive to negative, it does, it does the greatest work in what is called the capillaries. The negative blood must therefore return to the heart 
and, and from there be sent again to the lungs to be vitalized to positive polarity and this process continues. That's almost correct. I will say that. That is indeed how the circular story system works as in it's a constant cycle going through your heart being filled up with oxygen from your lungs and sent off to the system. It's just not positive or negative. And that's really where it comes into. It's important to have, you know, to do deep centered breathing and that will make you feel more positive. However, blood is made up of many components and some of them are positive and some of them are negative. It's not a determining factor, is not whether or not it's got a bunch of air in it or not. So blood is made up of uh, three different types of things. There's red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets as broad ranges of, of topic here. Um, you have in, in the red blood cells, which is specifically what they're talking about, they're not talking about the other components, heparin is in your in your blood stream and it is an anticoagulant so it's meant it is negatively charged and it's that's on purpose because it's meant to as your blood is flowing through your your veins or your capillaries or your arteries you don't want them clumping together and making blood clots so heparin is also the name of a medicine that one can take and it and it's named that way because it does this it's, it exists in your body they're just putting more of it back in there and it's it really and it is used to keep you from getting blood clots uh, usually if you have like heart problems and stuff. Uh, but blood also uh, contains a, a substance called colloidal, and that is positively charged. And it does indeed have an electrical charge that is positive. It uh, disperses uh, through the body in plasma, and plasma is 90% uh, water. That's the composition. Then you have hemoglobin, which uh, is also in the blood and it is positively charged. And it, it is uh, the, it, the membrane of the red blood cell though is negatively charged. And for the same reason that you have the anticoagulant because it want, you want the blood to flow through the veins, through the arteries without clumping. Now the rest of those, uh, the rest of the, the uh, chemicals that are in there each serve their own purpose. So a red blood cells are shaped kind of like a disc. It's a bioconclave. So it's just slightly a dip down. It like it has looks like it has a really thick rim and then a little disc shape on it. The uh, hemoglobin in the blood, which is positively uh, positively charged, is where it carries the uh, the oxygen in that little disc. But the oxygen itself is negatively charged. That's why they stay together. The negative, the oxygen is attracted to the hemoglobin, goes into the little disc shape, and, and it, that, sh it's that shape on purpose so it can maximize the amount of surface area of oxygen that can attach to it. And then as that moves, the oxidized cells move through the, the bloodstream, they encounter uh, CO2, carbon dioxide, which causes the oxygen to release. And uh, that does indeed go into it. All right, so the hemoglobin can bond with the CO2 as well. So it's you're just exchanging it. Think of it as if it's a, the red blood cells, a little, little uh, truck depot that is transporting the oxygen, gets into the, into the depot, right? And then you offload the one product, you unload the next, and then it keeps moving. That's really basically what it's doing. That's called the Bohr effect. Uh, CO2 is, is neutral though, whereas oxygen is not neutral, okay? So the CO2 is neutral, but it still uh, captures it. It's neutral uh, plasma, which is what it meets first. The CO2 meets the, the, the uh, neutral plasma first, and that's how the exchange sort of takes place. Yeah, right. The red blood cells are negative. The hemoglobin is positive. So, I mean, that's really how that process takes place. It's not quite what they're thinking of. The idea that oxygen is negative would, they would be like, no, it can't be because the breath of life is so important. And it's like, well, but it's still negative. It works in a similar fashion to what they're, they're seeing, just they kind of got the orders all wrong, but then they wouldn't have known yet 
the, any of those things. Now they did have a little, you know, a little map here, more specifically of where, where all the, the arteries are. And that's relatively accurate. I looked that up. It's like they got the they got the basic principles of it down there. There's nothing wrong with that. Now I did. This is their diagram of the. There's several of these like this. This is the nervous system. I mean, you, when you consider that this book was originally written in 1916 and the last time it was edited, it was like 1925. It's kind of amazing that they, they even, that they're trying to educate what, whoever they're letting in, they're, they would not have all necessarily gotten this kind of education in school the way we currently do. This right here is part of biology classes that would have start, starts in like middle school. And then you start learning more and more about it as you you know, get into high school and then further if you decide to go to college to, you know, to learn any of this stuff. But it, they're, the fact that they're doing this through mail order correspondence to anybody they've let into their club, it's kind of really rather interesting because that's, that's a good way to do this. So, and they're not quite off with what they're, they're talking about. And though I do find in here, there is there is talk about using the energy that it is traveling throughout your nervous system from your sympathetic nervous system specifically and harnessing that energy in order to uh, use it to do something else, in order to harness it, in order to heal yourself or to expend it in some other fashion. So there's more sympathetic nervous system there. And that's kind of fascinating to me. So let's see. The reason for the two forms of nervous system in the human body will be easily understood when we say that the spinal nervous system con conveys energy and power of a gross nature to take care of the physical actions and functions of the human body. The sympathetic nervous system, however, belongs to the psychic part of man. And there is a place in the human body shown in our monographs and thoroughly explained where psychic power and energy are generated and sent to the sympathetic nervous system. This system therefore uses a higher rate of energy, which is almost a, a cosmic energy. And this energy can be used for the healing of diseases and the curing of conditions because it, its real purpose in the human body is to carry on reconstructive actions in the body. That got me a little curious because I'm like, can we do that? I don't, never heard of anybody doing that. Um, and in theory, in a way, if you understand what the sympathetic nervous system does, we do kind of do that. We kind of do that when we're working out is really what we're doing because it, it's involuntary, uh, but it does regulate your heart rate, your blood pressure, your pupil dilation, sweating, uh, body temperature. It is the system that controls our fight or flight. That's really what it does. Are we in some kind of danger or something? And how are we responding to that? Because some people, you know, they're there are answers to retreat because of fear and some people's response to fear is to go rushing forward. So that's the fight or flight, right? So if you could control your emotions enough and you could focus on your breath enough and you could center yourself enough, you could take that fear, you know, the heightened emotions that come with fear and use that to do something else. Now, whether or not you can heal yourself, well, you know, Reiki is based upon that principle. There are other uh, energy touch uh, principles that are currently being explored that says it, this helps with that. I, to really know if it does it, I think we would need a lot of different scientific theories uh, tested. We would need some kind of lab science situation to see if you can consistently get it to do that in order to really scientifically prove that it's possible. But it is an interesting thought process. We can certainly control our breath. We can certainly control our emotions if we put enough effort into it. We don't have to react in the way, in a negative way. We don't have to do the things that uh, it is, you know, that we don't have to go back to our base instincts. We can choose. So, it, and it's really basically a very advanced version of that. The next chart in here is, shows the vertebrae. 
And this is accurate. These are indeed what these portions of the vertebrae are called, still in today's modern science. Uh, what I did here find to be very interesting is when they're talking about this and uh, colors and music. In the monographs of the sixth degree, there are complete instructions on how members can easily take advantage of the relationship between various nerves and their association with colors, music, sound, and nerve energy. We show our members the music notes that will arouse certain connections with the sympathetic nerve system into special activity and therefore cause the energy of the nerves to function more freely and completely. The same is true in the regards of colors. And we show our members even how even in the mind, in the, well, the mind and thought waves can reach the sympathetic connection and help in the curing and relieving of conditions. That I find to be very interesting because that follows the principle very much of the Druidic teachings. Music is magic. Words are magic. Your thoughts are magic. What you focus on in, the, in your energy, where you put your attention, you work to make manifest. So if you focus on negative, you will get negative. If you focus on positive, you will get positive. And when one is in a higher or negative, you know, like a negative or positive, higher polarity, positive attitude, negative polarity, negative attitude, right? Like that. If you were to listen to music or you were to look at art or you were to look at something that you find relaxing, be out in nature, see that sunset, look at that ocean, you know, whatever those are, you will change your mood. And if you change your mood into a highest, best place, you're supposed to attract more uh, polarity. That's just, you know, more positiveness. You switch your polarity. You have the ability to change the way you react to your environment. You can't control what other people do, but you can control how you react to what other people do. You are either going to allow other people to change your mood and stress you out in the negative or not which I don't recommend. I don't I recommend you let other people alter your mood. Sometimes you can't help it and you need to recenter yourself. So then go do these kinds of things. And it's a kind of inherent to our nature. People, you know, nobody had to tell me when I was a child that when, you know, when I was in one mood, listen to this song. I understood that listening to certain songs made me feel good. And listening to other songs did not make me feel so good. I didn't like the way this sounded or I didn't like the way that looked. Or I, like I like... I don't really, not really fond of abstract art. I'm a little bit too linear for that. I like things when I'm looking at them to understand what I'm looking at. I don't have any abstract art in my house. Everything is like landscapes and things like that because I like landscapes. They make me feel more relaxed though, landscapes, because nature makes me feel relaxed. So I've filled my house with art that makes me feel at peace. And I listen to music that either supports a mood that I'm already in if I'm feeling already upbeat and positive or music that will move me into that mood and take me out of a negative mindset. Sometimes though, some of the music I listen to, I might be moody and I still choose to listen to moody music because it helps me, you know, move through the mood because we're not supposed to deny our feelings. That's how you end up with really big problems and on medicines and talking to therapists. So I don't recommend that. But you know, music is a tool. It, you do change yourself with art, uh, you know, on a quantum level. That's, it, that's not a maybe. Quantum mechanics will tell you that these sounds, vibrations, colors, this the energy that's in all things will affect you on a, on a quantum level. And music is a tool and we should use it for that purpose. The next section that they have here, it talks about ganglia, right? No, no, that looks like that's a bunch of lines. But what they're really doing there is there's a bunch of nerves that they are connecting together, that they say have, uh, have direct connections with, uh, with different parts of the, the body. And specifically back in here, in, in with the nerves as they run through the, the spinal column. So ganglia, which, you know, is not a term that everybody's going to even know uh, about, is uh, 
they're they're basically just portions of the the synaptic relay stations. That's where they're synaptic relay stations in your in your nerve system. They're they're the neurons between uh, both the voluntary and on autonomic branches of the peripheral nervous system. Uh, so they're in the spinal cord. That's why they're in here and they're just right after the vertebrae because they're in there. And the information enters into this these things and makes the neurons all excited and stuff and then it leaves. Think of it as like a little mini you know, dance club in your spinal cord <laughs> for these for these little ganglia. Uh, and then the one of the other terms that they have in here, so A, which is on here, and in different places. So you'll have to, you know, there's different parts on the chart where it's at with the A's. But they're saying all the A's, right, is the sympathetic trunk running to the brain down through the body, connected to the first four rami in the uh, superior cervical ganglion. So Rami was another one where I had to go, no, okay, I don't know what that is either. So I'm going to, maybe the people who are watching do, and I just don't know, but most of us, the average person doesn't go to any kind of medical school. So we probably don't know what that is. It's a plural of uh, Ramus, which is a branch that is connecting two nerves or two arteries. I mean, in most of this, you would really have to go back and forth with the chart. Uh, which I'm you're not necessarily going to tell. I'm not going to go back and forth like that on this. It would just simply take too much time. You're better off if you really wanted to do this. Get the book, look at the picture, sit down and sort through it. I'm sure it'll make much more sense to somebody who's in a medical industry than the rest of us trying to uh, really go through and fill it out. So, in, in but basically what they're saying is there's a loop. The ganglion is a nerve acting as a loop connecting uh, two ganglia, which is shown in the, in the diagram. From this loop, there are three sympathetic nerves leading into plexus number 14 and spinal nerves 15A and 15B. So that was another one where I had to go plexus. Plexus is a network of animosing, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, animosing or interlacing blood vessels or nerves. So it's things that overlap with each other. So, and they made a very big deal about they have diagrammed all of this out. And part of the, the purpose for these uh, teachings in the first place is to try to, to get you to understand that your body is a system. We know that now um, because we have education that says so. But again, these books were written a long time ago. It was not part of your daily education. You would not have necessarily known that one thing could lead to another. I mean, Correlation doesn't equal causation. We know that. But some things are interconnected as your body is a system. The systems do play with each other. It's not separate. So this diagram here does play into the diagram before. You're not, if you wanted the symbols, if you see symbols on here, you don't understand it. They are on this plate. And so you would have to go back and forth between the two of them in order to figure it out. Uh, like I found a lot of this very interesting because of the energy transference, but I don't necessarily want to go into reading every single section of it. The next uh, diagram in here has to do with the details of the head and the neck and how all of that plays in together. Uh, <laughs> they don't necessarily have this wrong, but they don't, like it's not nearly enough. We know way more about how the brain functions now than we did before. Not that we're perfect at that. We understand about how 10% of the brain functions right now. We understood a lot less when this was written. So, but it does go through and give different parts to the brain. But if you do go through and you read this, understand that we understand better now how the brain functions and you're better off looking on the internet for that. But it does all interplay with each other. As you think, so shall you attract, right? So how you focus your thoughts, especially if you're looking at it from a spiritual, you know, the magic and the science all being interconnected together. What you concentrate on, you attract. So where your thoughts go during the course of the day is what 
at least in theory, you're telling the universe you want. So if you only focus on all the things that can go bad, all you will ever get is the things that can go bad. It's not that you shouldn't spend any time thinking about the things that could go bad. Plan for the worst, hope for the best. You got you to spend a lot more time over here and a lot less time over there. The purpose of is planning for the worst is literally to plan. What, uh, what are the problems? How can I mitigate them? Don't assume you can't mitigate them. You're not going to mitigate all of them. Some risks, some problems, you're going to have to just absorb and deal with because that's life. But you can try to figure out how to make it so this side of the negativity doesn't actually occur that often. You can plan for it so that you can hope for better. And if you are a nervous person, especially if you got anxiety like I do, you really are better off. And like I've learned the hard way through my life that the battle for it of anxiety is to be analytical. Anxiety lies to you all of the time. It is lying to you pretty much 100% of the time. It will tell you the world is ending for anything that doesn't go the way you want it to go. And that's just not true. The world is not ending. Stop and think about what it is you're saying. If this, if I don't get this thing I want, is the world literally going to stop? Is it going to explode? No, no, it's not. So what is going to happen instead? What exactly are the repercussions and how can you make it so you're working to get what you want, right? That's all part of the same theory. And they're following that same kind of theory because science and magic were once one. We didn't have the differentiation. Now they're continuing because we did know the differentiation by the time that they wrote this. <laughs> they're purposefully continuing this. They're a secret society but they're moving along the lines of stuff that has been taught by nature-based religions since the beginning of time. So it's not really new. They're just looking at it in a different way and they're teaching it within their society. Okay, that's enough for this video. Uh, I will be, we'll have one more after this and uh, I will see you guys next time.